Hello, I'm Avery Fisher Udagawa, translator of Temple Alley Summer by Sachiko Kashiwaba. I recently had the privilege of translating another Kashiwaba novel called, in English, The House of the Lost on the Cape. It is set in a fictional town in a real prefecture, the town of Kitsunezaki in Iwate. Iwate is the author's home. Iwate, along with Fukushima and Miyagi prefectures, was gravely affected by the earthquake and tsunami and nuclear disaster that began on March 11, 2011. And the novel opens on that day. I will read from a section of chapter one uh, that starts in a train. A woman named Yurie is riding that train with no uh, destination in mind. She is fleeing a violent husband. In the same car are a silent girl named Moeka and a woman who is unnamed who seems to work for the government uh, who is taking Moeka to live with relatives in Kitsunezaki after some kind of tragedy. From The House of the Lost on the Cape, Chapter 1. An announcement flowed through the loudspeakers. Apparently the train was nearing the station. Seeing Moeka shoulder her backpack, Yurie also grabbed her bag. She was on a journey with no fixed destination, after all. Her concern for Moeka was nudging her to take a little side trip. She wanted to see what kind of uncle would be coming to meet Moeka, and though she knew she would be in no position to say goodbye to the girl, she wanted to see her off when she rode away in her uncle's car. May he be kind, Yurie thought, as if praying. The station was called Kitsunezaki, Box's Point. Besides Yurie and the other two, seven or eight people got off the train. They all climbed into cars parked at the station or strode away briskly. Soon, the three were the only ones who remained at the station as a light snow fell in the chilly air. A deserted shopping street led away from the station, down a gentle slope toward the sea. Moeka and the woman walked into a small eatery called the Seashore Diner, so Yurie parted the half-curtains at the entrance and went in, too. They all ordered the sea urchin-topped ramen, and upon finishing hers at the table next to Moeka and the woman, Yurie smiled and ventured to say, That had green shiso leaves in it, didn't it? Delicious. Just then, the earthquake struck. Screaming, they dove under the tables. Glass from the windows smashed to the floor, shards of it bouncing their way. They covered their heads and curled into balls. When the shaking finally stopped, they inched out from beneath the tables. None of them had experienced a quake of this magnitude before. They could hear groaning from the kitchen. Since it was well after two, they were the only customers in the diner. Stepping over a television, which had crashed to the ground, as well as fluorescent lights from the ceiling and manga volumes that had tumbled off the bookshelf, they peered into the kitchen. The cook was pinned beneath a heavy shelf of dishes that had tipped over, they couldn't call for help. Their phones didn't work. Surely the three of us can make do. The woman put her hand to the shelf, and it moved a little. No sooner had they managed to pull the cook from under the shelf and breathe a sigh of relief than a siren began to blare. They heard an announcement. A tsunami is coming. Move to high ground. Yurie and the two other travelers didn't comprehend at first, but the cook turned white as a sheet. We have to go now. The train platform is the highest spot nearby. They raced out of the diner, the limping cook leading them. The main roads to the station were jammed with cars. People from all over were running toward the station, scrambling over fallen signs and broken glass on the sidewalks. Where did they all come from? Yurie wondered in surprise. When she and the others had gotten off the train, the town had looked empty. Oh no, I forgot the documents I have to give Moeka-chan's uncle. I'll catch up with you, please. Take her on ahead. The woman turned before the cook could stop her. The earth thundered behind them. Don't look back, the cook shouted. Yurie gripped Moika's hand and sprinted for the station. The platform was packed with people. Is mom here? I don't see Obachan Anzai from next door. Everyone was searching for someone they knew. Will we be okay up here? Where else are we going to go? The words came out in shouts. Everyone was panicky. Yurie looked around for the woman who had been with Moika, but she didn't see her anywhere. Then the pitch-black tsunami swallowed the station building below them. It slammed into the base of the platform where they stood. Dong! 
and cold spray rained down on them. Close your eyes, close your eyes. Yuria drew Moika inside her coat and held her. The black water ripped the red roof off the station entrance below and carried it away. The scene was surreal. Yuria was so frightened that she couldn't keep her body from shaking. A house floated by, making horrific sounds. The hand of death was reaching out for them. Yuria held Moika tightly to her, as if making themselves smaller might cause death to overlook them. Moika shook, too. Yuria wanted to calm Moika's trembling. She wanted to protect her from the cold. Chilled to the bone herself, Yuria felt a hint of warmth only where Moika was. When dawn came at last, Yuria could no longer think. She could barely process that they had survived. She could only hold tight to Moika and whisper, It's all right, it's all right. The town was gone. What was left of it looked like a war zone on television or in a movie. All that kept her from bursting into tears was Moika's presence. Moika's large eyes were wide, and she was shivering. Yurie and Moika headed for the Kitsunezaki Middle School gym with the others from the platform. They could see the gym's roof from a distance, but there was no road. Yurie climbed over the rubble, her feet getting caught in the mud left behind by the tsunami. Gripping Moika's hand so tightly it hurt, she almost crawled to the gym. When she and Moika arrived, their knees gave way and they sank to the floor. Volunteers removed their wet shoes and wrapped them in blankets. So Yurie and Moika arrive in Kitsunezaki, but in a very different manner than they imagined. They soon receive new names and meet a very special elder named Kiwa, who becomes the third along with them, main character in The House of the Lost on the Cape. Thank you for listening.